God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Seated. When I first came back to the church in my early 30s, uh, it was by the grace of God. I just happened to walk in on a service one day at a church I'd never been to, and something caught me. But I stayed in church, and here I am, uh, because the more often I was there, and the better I paid attention, the more I realized that what I had seen of life to that point, and what I believed was important, was best explained in Christian terms. That the Christian description of the way the world works is the best. And 10 days ago, I saw just a little practical example. A week ago Friday, I went uh, back to the boarding school in New Hampshire where I got my high school education. It's a big, old, well-established school, a couple hundred years old. It's been co-ed for some time, but it was all male uh, when I was there. I hadn't been back for many years, but last weekend they opened a new athletic facility. Uh, and I went up for the dedication because the building's entrance hall was named after a man who had been my roommate of uh, my sophomore year, who had died a few years ago. The night before the ceremony, the school gave a dinner for about 50 people, mostly the big donors who had funded the project. I had not given the nickel. I was there kind of on the quiet because of my friendship with this guy. And all evening I had the feeling somebody was going to finger me as an imposter and yank my beef wellington out from in front of me and toss me out on my ear. But I managed to make it through the evening undetected. <laughs> Sitting across from me at the dinner was a woman in her mid-30s, looked to be, with a very friendly face. And her name tag identified her as staff. So I asked her what her job was at the school. And she said, I'm the athletic director. I have to confess, I was a bit surprised by this. I reacted. I was an old boy mindset. Sports have always been a big deal at this school. The price tag on this new facility was $35 million. So athletic director is a big job. And the directors I remembered were much older, beefy men. As we talked, she told me she'd gotten her master's degree in health and wellness. Again, not a credential that I was used to in connection with athletic directors. But when I asked her what her main sport had been, she said rugby. So <laughs> <laughs> clearly she knew what it meant to be a competitor. And at one point I asked her what she liked best about her job. And she thought for just a second. And then she said, removing obstacles. One more time, this was not exactly in the ballpark of possible responses that this old boy, feeling older by the minute, was ready for. <clears throat> so I asked her to elaborate on that. And she went on to say that there are a lot of rules in sports and in any organization, and rules are usually there for good reasons, but sometimes one of them gets in the way. New situations happen all the time, and there can be personal issues with any kid, or with any coach, for that matter, that need to be addressed. In all these cases, she said, what you need is a person there with a broader vision and with authority to step in and say, we need to do something differently here. I could see that what she was actually saying she liked best about her job was helping people to be who they really are. Not to insist that they fit into a certain mold or perform up to a certain level, but to help them express, in this case physically through the medium of sports, their true selves. I could see that her degree in health and wellness had been well earned. She'd done the work. She'd done the work. And as I thought about it later, something else occurred to me. As I had learned, that as I had learned all those years ago, what we talk about in church explains all of this. Explains, it describes what's really happening. In the Episcopal Church, we talk about joining in God's mission of restoration and reconciliation. This is our way of expressing the fundamental Christian belief that we live in a world that's gone wrong, that God works to put things right again, and that God calls us to join in that work, which work often involves removing obstacles. And I think that's also a pretty good description of something Paul talks about in today's reading from 1 Corinthians. This passage, and the one that we heard last week, uh, which comes right before it in the letter, those passages are the kind that make most people tune right out. They're almost impossible to understand without some context. So I'm, I'm very briefly going to try to help with that because it's important. It has to do with removing obstacles. 
In the Mediterranean world of Paul's time, when you had a big social gathering, it was common practice to rent the banquet hall of a local temple, exactly the same way we rent our parish hall. And by temple, I don't mean synagogue, I'm but the temple of one of the Greek or Roman gods. So it was a pagan temple. And the meat served at such places would have been from animals sacrificed in the worship of the pagan god of the temple. The Corinthian Christians had written to Paul asking, among other things, if it were permissible for them to eat this meat. And that's what he's responding to in this part of the letter. Paul's, Paul answers essentially that it is permissible because as Christians, they know that those gods are illusions. In the passage we heard last week, he writes, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, yet for us there is one God, the Father, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Therefore, there can be no thought among Christians that the food served at the temple has any religious significance at all. It's just meat. However, Paul tells the Corinthians, be careful. It's all right for you to eat that food, but for you to eat that food because you know that its dedication to the God means nothing. But, and remember this is the first century, the very beginning of the church that Paul was building, but he says, it is not everyone who has this knowledge, the knowledge of the one Lord and the one God. Take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. That is to say, others who may not be as advanced as you in Christian faith, but these are the ones he refers to as weak, Others may see you eating such food, not understanding that it's just meat to you, and therefore think you could be a Christian and still follow other gods. Paul is saying that the most important thing for us as Christians is to care for our sisters and brothers as we spread the gospel, the good news among them, and what we say and do. To meet them wherever they are, on their path to God. In the same way that that athletic director meets the students in her charge where they are in their involvement with sports. And meeting them where they are is what Paul is talking about today in the words we heard. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all. To the Jews I became as a Jew. To those under the law I became as one under the law. To the weak I became weak. I have become all things to all people. That sounds pretentious, but that's what he's talking about. He's, Paul is talking about removing obstacles between himself and other people. And because he's doing it in the service of the gospel, what he's actually doing is removing obstacles between those people and God. So that God can get in there and do God's work. And those people can become their truest selves. That's what Paul is doing. That's what we try to do in church. That's what that athletic director is doing. And as it happens, we see a beautiful picture of this process of Jesus doing it in today's gospel story. Simon Peter's mother is sick in bed with a fever. The disciples tell Jesus about her, and then the evangelist Mark tells us in his very simple way what Jesus does. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve her. He took her by the hand. He showed her that he was her friend, and she could trust him. He lifted her up. He honored her true self, a child of God. And at that, those two things, the fever, what dominated her, what kept her down, left her. The obstacle was removed, and she began to serve them, to be her truest self. As Jesus says, whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. I don't know anything about that athletic director's faith life. But in what she calls removing obstacles, she is taking people by the hand and lifting them up. That's joining in God's mission of restoration and reconciliation. Those opportunities are around us all the time. Here in church is where we learn to see that and to act on it and thereby become our truest selves. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.